Praise the Lord. Everybody doing okay? Here we are. Good morning, church family. Good morning, church family. The Lord is risen. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed, right? The Lord is risen. Say it, church. I can't hear you through the, the, the internet. The Lord is risen. Say it loud. He is risen indeed. Say it as loud as you can, even if you have to wake your neighbors. Say it so the whole world can hear you. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. This pandemic is historical in nature. I would add it has made some people hysterical in nature, right? We've all had to face different kinds of fears during this time in history. So here we are, 2020, pandemic. And uh, this service particularly is, um, is uh, meaningful to me in that, you know, just celebrated 11 years. And as I look back on how the Lord has moved in uh, my life and in the life of our church family together, part of that experience has been sweet. It's been wonderful. It's been, man, that is the Lord there. That is the Lord there. It's been difficult. It's been trying. And part of that uh, experience relates to church members that have died. And at this time, I would like to read to you the church members that have died uh, since I've been here at First Baptist Church of the Colony. Francis Martin, Morris Say, Pam Lyerly, Reba Robertson, Joanne McGee, Montana Lance, Logan Williamson, Charles Childs, Bill Bohm, Eloise Edmondson, Debbie Lance, Blake Dunkel, Dolores Davis, Anita Hethington, Jane Durrett, Bob Kaumeyer, Hazel White, Lee Baker, Rachel Monaranjani, Cindy Johnson, Matthew Vandervelde, Jean Lehman, Connie Bennett, Laura Stovall, Ron Ferrant, Pastor Ron Ferrante, and Anne Emanuel. Perhaps you're listening and you're not a member of our church, but you too know lo loved ones that have passed away. And I'm here to proclaim to you the good news of Jesus Christ. And that is all who die in Jesus Christ will one day be raised again. It's the game changer. It's the, the greatest game changer of all. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, there's been different kinds of legislation the Congress has passed that has been historical in nature. It's never been done before. I think we just uh, saw that recently with regard to the pandemic. But did you know that there are only a few documents that have changed, literally changed history? Only a few game changers, if you would. For example, the Magna Carta, produced in 1215. It was the first official document to raise the subject of human rights. That was a game changer. You may have heard of another document called the Declaration of Independence, 1776, perhaps the most well-known document in American history. It was completed on July 4th, 1776. Total game changer. Total game changer. This historical document granted Americans independence from the British crown. And I don't care what uh, unpatriotic liberals and progressive, uh, progressives think. This document marks the birth of the greatest nation on earth, America. Game changer. Amen. Of course, we could talk about the Constitution of the United States and the Bill of Rights. Absolute game changers. Young people, stay focused with me. I'm going a little historical, but stay focused with me, uh, uh, with me because if you do not know about the liberties in these documents, you will lose them. Do not take them for granted. You will lose them. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you need to engage in politics when you become adults and vote the way Jesus would vote. Amen. Don't make your Christianity a little bit about these four walls, us four and no more, where it's a privatized faith and it's not how you live out in public. No, no, that's not what Jesus Christ says we should be doing. 
How about the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863? Total game changer. It ended slavery. Praise God. By the way, Christians should work for the abolition of abortion. Not just to be pro-life, though that is good. Not just to have pro-life measures, that is good. No, no. We should work to abolish abortion in our country. And if you've forgotten about the high fives from the New York legislators when they passed the infanticide bill, you might remember that came before the pandemic. Could there be a correlation? Look what, what God does in his, with his own people in the nation of Israel when they start to slaughter the innocents. That would be a total game changer, wouldn't it? Man, I feel the presence of God. I feel the presence of God up here. Wouldn't that be a total game changer? The abolishment of abortion. One other example I have, the few, uh, regarding the few game-changing documents that has changed the course of history, is the Gutenberg Bible. How many of you ever heard the Gutenberg Bible? This was produced in 1455. Absolute total game changer. Religion aside, so let's just put religion aside for a moment. It's an indisputable uh, fact that the Bible is one of the most influential documents in our history. I would say the most. But this document, the, Gu the Gutenberg Bible, set the stage for print production moving forward in human history. And it was an absolute game changer because it helped to bring God's word to <clears throat> the common people it was locked up with the priests of rome it was locked up with the pope but with the gutenberg bible now it's being produced in mass to the masses roman catholic pun intended it went to the masses of people so what i want to do in this message is to summarize the ultimate game changer of god's word the ultimate game changer for example, did you know there are 592,439 words in the Old Testament? Did you know that? 592,439 words in the Old Testament. That makes up 76.57% of your Bible. Now, there's some preachers out there saying, well, we don't need the Old Testament and the values and the customs of the Old Testament. You know, it's so foreign to our modern world and we're so hip. So let's just get rid of the Old Testament and let's just preach the resurrection of Jesus. <laughs> let's cut off 75% of the Bible. <laughs> no, no, no. No, we're not going to do that. Not in this pulpit, not in this church, not in this message. And by the way, did you know that there are 181,253 uh, words in the New Testament? And that makes up 23.42% of your Bible. So roughly 75% Old Testament, 25% of New Testament. And I'm swinging for the fence today because what I want to do is I want to preach to you the entire message of the Bible from Genesis 1 to the maps, to the end of Revel the book of the Revelation. Now, what is so important about these words? What is so important about the words that are found in the Bible? Well, have you ever wondered why you have suffered such heartache and pain in your life? The resurrection has an answer for that. The, the words of the Bible have, a uh, have a, uh, uh, an answer for that through the resurrection. Have you ever, do you ever get mad when you see the madness out there in the world? Do you ever get sad when you see the craziness and the atrocities in the world? The resurrection has an answer for that. This, the message from the Bible has an answer for that. Have you ever thought about where God is or whether even God exists? And if God does exist, what on earth is he doing? I have an answer for you coming from the entire Bible. Have you ever answered the question, who am I? Other people are seeking to answer that for you, but today I'm asking you, have you ever answered that for yourself, who am I? Have you ever asked yourself, what am I doing here? Why, what, what's the purpose for my life? 
I have an answer for you from the Bible today. Do you know where you will spend eternity when you die? The resurrection answers these basic questions in a way that nothing else and no ancient or modern uh, document can answer. God answers those questions. So today I have the resurrection. Greatest game changer ever. And today I have four parts to the Bible's big story. Four parts to the Bible's big story. So let's get with it. But before we do, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I ask for your anointing. I thank you for it. I thank you for your presence. And I ask that you'll help me to preach, Lord. I'm a cracked vessel. I'm a crooked stick. I ask that you will use me, your servant, to bring life to the lost that have no life, to bring encouragement and hope to your bride, strengthen your bride through this message, bring people from death to life, from unbelief to belief, from no faith to saving faith, to the end that you are glorified and the gospel is gone out in a way that is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So four, four parts to the Bible's big story. Number one, Jesus' Jesus's resurrection is God's answer to the divine human rebellion which brought death to the world. Now that's a mouthful, I know, but this is a big Bible. <laughs> I've got a, ground, I got a lot of ground to cover here, right? So number one, Jesus' resurrection is God's answer to the divine human rebellion which brought uh, death to the world. Did you know that the first mention of death in the Bible comes from the lips of God himself. In Genesis 2, beginning in verse 15, it says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. Then the Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. There it is. And of course, if you know the, uh, the story, then comes the nakash. That's the Hebrew word, ha-nakash, for the serpent. Uh, it could also, that, that phrase in Hebrew, ha-nakash, or the nakash, it could also be translated as shining one or diviner, or he who discloses hidden knowledge, and all three of those are in play in the Hebrew term, the nakash, the serpent, the shining one, the diviner. And it was very basic, common understanding in the ancient Near East to depict divine spiritual beings as serpents. Basic, common knowledge. So what's being... Uh, uh, communicated here in the fall of humanity is not so, it's not uh, zoology, right? Six foot talking python. There's more going on here. There is a divine, uh, lesser divine spiritual being that is promoting full on rebellion. And Adam and Eve partake. It's a divine human rebellion. And so it begins. This is the beginning of all the chaos of all of the disorder and all of the dysfunction in our world. Indeed, death itself is now, now into the world. Welcome to the jungle. Every time someone dies, it should remind us that God is not a liar. The soul that sins, it shall die. Whether by accident, whether by disease, whether by war, whether by, by famine, whether by pandemic, any time and every time someone dies, it should be a reminder to us. And I know we all like to push it away from us. And in our modern day, we're really good at pushing death away from us. But it should be a reminder, God is not a liar. But then comes Jesus. Then comes Jesus. He's at a funeral uh, of one of his friends named Lazarus. And G Jesus completely ruins the funeral in the best way possible. In the best game-changing way. He tells the sister in mourning, your brother will rise again. Your brother will rise again. 
And this is what she says in John eleven twenty four. 24. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And listen to how Jesus Christ responds. He responds in a way that no mere man has ever come close to saying. He speaks as if he is God. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? He's speaking to Martha. Do you believe this? And I hope your answer to that question is just as Martha's. She said to him, quote, Yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Jesus' resurrection is God's answer to the divine human rebellion which brought death to the world. But there's a second part to the Bible's big story. Number two, Jesus' resurrection is God's answer to the divine human rebellion which multiplies sin in the world. In these last few years, I've discovered something about the Bible that I had not seen before. And perhaps this might be new to you, but this is coming from the Bible, the Bible's big story. And you know how when you go to the doctor, there are some doctors that special, they're general practitioners. You go to another doctor and he specializes in this and another specializes in that. If we hung around Dr. Ben Carson, the great brain surgeon, we went out to lunch with him, we would be learning what? Probably some serious knowledge about brain surgery, how the brain works, all that kind of thing. All right? Pastors are similar. They have focuses here and there, emphasis here and there. And what I'm swinging for in this message is the Bible's big story. And here I'm saying that Jesus' resurrection is God's answer to the divine human rebellion which multiplies sin in the world. Listen, not according to our modern world, according to the Bible. The Bible's big story. And when you start to read it from the beginning, boom, Genesis 3, death enters. But there's another rebellion, divine human, in together, integrated together, that multiplies sin in the world to the degree that it causes the great flood. Most people in the church, they know about the flood, but they don't really understand why, or they understand in a general way. Another thing that I've discovered is that God had a spiritual family before he created the human family. He made a spiritual family of spiritual beings, before he made a physical family of human beings. You can read about this for yourself in Job 38, Genesis 1, Genesis 11, uh, Isaiah 6, and a whole lot of other places in the Old Testament. This spiritual family functions like a council. It function, functions like a court. It functions like an army. And again, as a family. God made them to function like this and to do so under his rule, under his authority. Did he need them? No, just like he doesn't need you or me, but he does it anyways. It's, it's how he works. But guess what? God's spiritual family became dysfunctional. Some members of the spiritual family went rogue. As one of our members like to say, it went wheels off. We saw it from one member of his spiritual family in Genesis 3. Now there's a bunch more joining in the dysfunction. Uh, can I just back, back up for a second as it relates to dysfunction and dysfunctional families? Can I give it, can, can you wave at me? Is there any dysfunction in your family? Can I get a wave? Okay, is any, okay, wait a minute. There's some members of my family waving now. What is going on? It's the truth, Right? We like to cover up the dysfunction. Sometimes we're good at it. Sometimes we're not. Listen, we're all a big mess, but, we, but I'm speaking to the human family now. Take some comfort. It started in the spiritual family. They started this mess. So God has spiritual dysfunction in his family. He's got human physical dysfunction among the, the, the human race. How is he fixing in that? Through his son, Jesus Christ. Listen to this major dysfunction. Have you ever read this in the Bible? Now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they took wives for themselves whomever they chose. 
Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever because he is also flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. This is a big, bad thing. And when he limits the number 120, that's just enough time to build the ark. I'm done with humanity. That's what's going on here. Verse 4, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. And here's the summary of the madness, the proliferation of sin that is ramping up even more after Genesis 3. It's ramping up more in the biblical narrative. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. This is, a, this is the great God who is transcendent and outside of time and he's using anthropomorphic language. He's using uh, human language to depict his response in the space-time continuum, uh, continuum in which we live. Is he surprised by this? No. He knows all this is going on before he ever said, let there be light. We're not on plan B. We're not on plan C. But this is the God of the Bible's response in space time. There is another divine human rebellion in the history of humanity against God. Every time the term sons of God is used in the Old Testament, every time it refers to divine beings. Okay? Okay? Notice, sons of God. Sons is a familial, familial term, a term of family of God, meaning they're divine. Sons of God, divine beings. Are they equal to God? Of course not. Of course not. So what's going on? The sons of God corrupt mankind by helping humanity destroy themselves. And this happens in four major critical areas. And if you're taking notes, I would urge you to write these down. Here's what's going on. They help mankind, and they, they help humans destroy themselves in the craft of sexual immorality. For instance, the sons of God taught women how to paint the eye to be more seductive. Ladies, can you say Maybelline or whatever the, the cosmetic line is, right? The sons of God taught women. Now, don't say Pastor Mark said I can't wear mascara anymore or makeup anymore. Don't go, like, don't go legalistic on me. I'm just telling you what's going on here. The sons of God help humanity as it relates to the craft of, hum, uh, of, of sexual immorality. And they, 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 they taught women how to bejewel themselves with bracelets and necklaces and earrings in order to be more attractive, in order to engage in sexual immorality. Does that sound familiar, anybody? This is why... This is rather the background to Peter when he writes something like this to the married women of God. Listen to this. Your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. That, that is beautiful there. So, they helped mankind destroy itself in the craft of sexual immora immorality. The sons of God helped to destroy and proliferate sin, pump up sin in the craft of pharmacology, a.k.a. drugs. Need I say more? Americans spend at least $344 billion on prescription drugs last year. Praise God for medicine. Amen. But, we, but are we really going to assume that all of those drugs are not being used or, or rather abused? They're not being abused or that all of them are truly needed? We are prescribing and popping pills for everything. Some drugs are needed. But if you're popping a pill to supposedly cure an emotional problem or a spiritual problem, you're just masking it over. Don't deal just with the fruit. Deal with the root. Now, for illicit drugs or illegal drugs, Americans spend roughly $150 billion on cannabis, cocaine, heroin, and methamphetamine. 150 B, 
$1.5 billion on illicit drugs. Perhaps you've heard this quote, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Yeah, and that's what the sons of God were cooking up before God uh, started all over in the flood. And we see, we see the same effects today. By the way, in the book of the Revelation, it says that the nations are led astray through, Babylon, uh, through Babylon's uh, sorcery. And you dig up that word sorcery in the Greek, it's where we get our English word pharmacology. So in the ancient world, and actually today when you study occultism, there are, it's, also, it's often commingled with uh, occultism is, Satan is Satanism and Luciferianism. It's commingled with drugs. So they helped to destroy mankind in the craft of sexual morality, in pharmacology, number three, in the craft of divination. I heard the other day that there are now, listen, I heard that there are now more witches in America than uh, Presbyterians. Now, I haven't looked that up. It might have been a particular group of Presbyterians, but it would not surprise me. And do you know why? The Enlightenment has left a void of spiritual things And dark powers are doing what their evil counterparts and uh, partners did in Genesis 6. There's a new age that has risen. risen. There's a new revival of the new age in America. And then fourthly, in the craft of war. Do you want a modern day example of this? How about the nuclear bomb? You know what that's called? That's called a game changer, right? Guess what the new game changer is in the field of war now? You know what it is? Hypersonic missiles. Hypersonic missiles. A hypersonic missile can reach basically anywhere in the world in 30 minutes. And we should say, uh uh-oh, because you can put a nuclear bomb on a hypersonic missile. 30 minutes. And so pray for our military leaders because they're scrambling with regard to that technology. Earlier this year, Russia rolled out, yeah, we got one of those. So, the sons of God help mankind to kill themselves better in the form of metallurgy, the working of metal, warcraft. So, what's happening? The proliferation of sin. That's what's happening. And in the Genesis 6 account, it's to the degree that God says, I'm sorry I made you all. I'm done. Let's hit the reset button, but I'm going to save humanity through Noah and his family. That's it. I'm going to start all over again. We think it's bad now today. (laughs) We're not there yet. But I do read in the Gospels where Jesus Christ says that the end will come as it was in the days of Noah. As in the days of Noah. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. By the way, as it relates to the proliferation of sin in humanity, you know, after the flood, the Old Testament law was given to help slow down the same kind of sinning that occurred before the great flood. Did you know that? It's like speed bumps. Don't do this. Don't do this. Stop, stop, stop. Now, here comes Jesus. Here comes Jesus. The sons of God leave their domain, take upon flesh, go into women, and absolutely corrupt humanity to the degree that God has to start all over. He floods the world. So do you think that it's a coincidence that when God sends his son to fix the mess of the sons of God and that of humanity, that the capital S son of God enters humanity through a virgin? Do you think that's just a coincidence? I don't think so. I don't think so. It's called poetic retribution. Jesus' resurrection is God's answer to the divine rebellion which multiplies sin in the world. And in addition to all this, it's related to false teaching about sex, drugs, war, divination. All of that is corrected in the teaching of Jesus. In other words, his teaching undoes their teaching. And so when Jesus is casting out demons, that is another way he is showing that he is the answer to the divine human rebellion which multiplies sin in the world. When he speaks and when he teaches and preaches, he's reversing the false teaching of the spiritual wicked powers. This is why in all of his teaching he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. You know, I grew up in the the beautiful city of St. Petersburg, Florida. 
and there's a uh, bridge there that's called the Skyway Bridge. Has, have you, you know what I'm talking about? It's absolutely beautiful. It connects uh, St. Petersburg with Sarasota, and it it's kind of bridges the mouth into Tampa Bay. Absolutely gorgeous. And I remember as a boy that uh, there was, I believe it was a Monday morning, it was a storm, it was cloudy, and a barge hit uh, one of the uh, pillars of the bridge. And at the apex flat, the flat apex of the bridge, uh, a large section fell hundreds of feet down. A city bus filled with people fell. Other, other cars fell, and the people fell to their deaths. And there's a true story that there was a teacher on his way to school, and he was driving. He felt the rumble, and he saw those in front of him fall to their deaths. And he stopped and skids, and his car literally comes like 18 inches from the edge. And so he's in a state of shock and panic, and he turns, and he sees these other cars, and they go over, and they go over. He gets up out of his car. He turns around to the oncoming traffic, and he says, Stop! 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 Some did not listen, and they perished. Some did listen, and they were saved. When Jesus Christ preaches, a frequent refrain is, Stop, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Listen to the voice of the Lord. Turn around and turn to God or you will perish. Any preacher, any worship leader, any professor, any scholar, any whoever who turns God's grace into a go-ahead, a green light to sin, is following false teaching which comes from wicked spirits. If they're saying things like, it's okay to live together, it's okay to have sex <clears throat> before marriage, it's okay to be homosexual, it's okay to be transsexual, it's not okay. It's not okay. It will only lead to your destruction. But the good news is Jesus Christ loves sinners. And he calls us to repent and to trust him and to listen to him. He's the greatest lover of all. His name is Jesus. Now, there's a third part to the Bible's big stories. We continue. Number three, Jesus' resurrection is God's answer to the divine human rebellion, which not only caused sin and death and the proliferation of sin, but also which caused the division of the whole world. When you're reading the Bible, this is the narrative. It ramps up. It starts in Genesis 3, ramps up even more Genesis 6. You got the flood. Let's try this again. How does that work out? Not really good. How do we know that? Genesis 11. <clears throat> in Deuteronomy 32, we have something that um, many people uh, are not getting as it relates to the Bible story. And only because I've been digging in this the last three or four years have I got it. Listen to Deuteronomy 32, 8. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of man, he set boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. There they are again. Divine human rebellion. God says, go, be fruitful and multiply, right? Make Eden, make Eden all over the world. And what does man do? No, we're going to build a city. We're going to build a tower. Make sure that guy upstairs doesn't flood the world again. Maybe we can uh, survive another flood. Divine human rebellion. So God comes down to this little rinky-dinky flood, and he divides the nations not only by, by vocabulary, right, languages or whatever, but according to Deuteronomy 32 and other places in Deuteronomy I could show you, he divided the number of the sons of man according to the number of the sons of God and when you read that in the context of Genesis there's a number to it 70 depending on uh, uh, the Hebrew text that you use to translate it could be 72 dividing depending on how you count up the nations but that's the number 70 72 well guess what here comes Jesus now here comes Jesus he calls his 12 disciples he begins his public ministry in the book of Luke and how many people does he send out as he begins his public ministry there's a number to it <clears throat> 70 
70. This is the point. You may recall where the 70 come back and they're, they're almost hyperventilating. They said, Jesus, hey, listen, even the demons obey us. And he's like a proud father saying, I saw Satan fall like lightning. Nevertheless, do not rejoice that the demons are subject to you, but rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Do you think that's just a coincidence? Not if you're reading the Bible in the narrative, in the flow, in the big Bible flow. Jesus Christ is communicating not just by mere words. He's communicating by what he is doing. He's telegraphing a message. I'm taking the nations back. It's time for the nations to come back to God. Amen. Wouldn't it be wonderful if this pandemic that has, uh, that has such rocked the world and brought America to a halt, that the nations would wake up and say, we need to get back to God. It would be worth it. It would be worth it. Israel was supposed to be a conduit for the nations to come back to God in the Old Testament. But how did that work out? Didn't work out too well, did it? Israel had its history and the law, the the moral laws and the religious laws and the ceremonial laws, but Israel became proud and turned to idolatry that was cooked up by the sons of God. I'll never forget the first time in Israel on a Saturday evening. We were hungry and we were so happy. We saw a, uh, uh, a sign out and it was a pizza, a pizzeria. They're in Israel. I was so happy. I was so hungry. It was a Saturday evening. I walk up to the front and I order a pepperoni pizza right there in Israel. And they looked at me like I was crazy. And I thought it was a language problem. I'm not like, no, no, I want cheese and I want, you know, pepperoni, pepperoni meat, pepperoni. And they're looking at me like, are you out of your mind? And I'm thinking, am I having trouble uh, communicating here? This is a pizza place. Would you please give me some pepperoni on my pizza? And there's a guy that, that understands what's going on with the, 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 the silly, dumb, g- Gentile American preacher. <laughs> and it's the Sabbath. It's the Sabbath. Are you serious? The laws of Israel bleeding over, even to today. In fact, when Monica and I were in Israel, uh, I did not try that again. I learned my lesson. Uh, But we did notice that there was an elevator that was used, if you were a Jew, just for the Sabbath, in the hotel room. It said, you know, uh, basically, Sabbath elevator. And we're like, what? So evidently, there's, there's actually an elevator that Jews use on the Sabbath. You can't use the other one. Think about that, a Sabbath elevator. There had become such a distinction with all of these laws. There had become such a distinction and a division between Israel and the nations by the time of Jesus Christ that it blinded the nation of Israel to their Messiah. This past week, I read a headline about Israel that caught my attention. Did you hear about this? Here's the the title of the, the headline, quote, Netanyahu, Prime Minister of Israel, Netanyahu considers Paschal Lamb sacrifice on Temple Mount for first time in 2,000 years. This pandemic has so rattled Israel. There's a group in Israel who want to sacrifice a lamb, evidently to avert God's wrath in regard to the pandemic, just like in Exodus where the wrath of God was averted with the the blood of the lamb on the doorposts. I didn't know this, but evidently in that article it says that every year the Israeli police stop several people attempting to bring sheep onto the Temple Mount for the purposes of personal sacrifices. How sad, how tragic. What did John the Baptist, the preparer of the Messiah, what did he say? Look, there he is, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And there was a blinding in Israel and they slaughtered their own Messiah. They slaughtered the Lamb. Evidently, there's also a request to perform the ceremony in the proper place and at the proper time. In times past, those requests have been rejected. 
but, it, but the request from the Sanhedrin received an unexpectedly different response this year. Jesus Christ, his resurrection is God's answer to the divine human rebellion which caused the division of the world into the nations. He comes and now it's not just for the Jews only, it's for all the Gentiles. And all of you Gentiles out there said, what? <laughs> Amen. Amen. He brings Jew and Gentile together as one, a new humanity, if you would, as one. It doesn't matter if you're male or female, the color of your skin, the socioeconomic level at you. We are all now one together. We're no longer divided. We're now one in Jesus Christ. Praise his name. Praise his name. The Jews were looking for a Messiah as expressed in Psalm 2. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, the, the smeared one, the Messiah, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son that he not become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. That's the Messiah. He's taken the nations back. Amen. Amen. Jesus Christ died. He was raised to life. And before he leaves the earth, what does he say? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go there, therefore, make disciples of what? All the nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. And that age and that age's end may be upon us now. The Great Commission. The Great Commission. Well, thank you for your time and patience with me. Here's the last one, number four. Number four. The fourth big part to God's big story. Jesus' resurrection is God's answer to the divine human rebellion. And he will renew all things, and this is important, in the world. In the world. Many people have been to church. They've heard uh, the preaching of heaven and the afterlife and eternity. And a lot of people picture heaven as if, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a bland place. It's a white place. We've got white robes and the fog machine comes up to about right here. And everybody's just like plucking on harps for all of eternity. That is not what is depicted in heaven. That might be hell for some of you, frankly, right? Are we going to be singing worship songs like forever? Okay, I like Jason Kelly and the band. Can we have some more songs, please? I mean, is that it? Or, or other depictions of heaven? Uh, it, it's a place of rest, right? You rest from your labors. That's actually uh, from Revelation. But is that all there is to heaven? We're going to be resting, like resting on a, like a cloud, for all of eternity, hello? No, no, so much more. For it. it is so much more technicolor than that, so vivid in color than that. It is not bland. No, no, it is variegated in color. At the end of the, at the, end of the book, God recreates Eden on earth. Heaven comes back down to earth. The lion will lay down with the lamb. In other words, God's going to get his way. The Lord's Prayer, we pray what? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done where? On earth 
as it is in heaven. He's going to answer that prayer. He's going to answer that prayer. He's going to renew all things. All things. Now, I can't finish this message without reading Matthew 28. It will be familiar to some of you. Would you hear the word of the Lord? This is Matthew's narration of the resurrection. Now, after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn, toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, just as he said. Come, see the place where he was lying, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee, and there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And Matthew says, and they left the tomb quickly, notice this, (laughs) with fear and great joy, and ran to report it to his disciples. (laughs) Oh, how beautiful. They're flooded with fear and great joy, and they run to tell everybody, his disciples. Wow. Amen. Amen. This is the greatest game changer ever, ever. There are game changers in the field of music. There are game changers in the field of business. There are game changers in the field of music. But songs will end. They've got a bridge, perhaps some modulation, songs end. There's good ideas that are game changers in businesses. We make money, businesses come and go. We thank God for the breakthroughs in medicine that help and aid and prolong our lives. But eventually, everyone dies. It's only a temporary aid. Jesus Christ is God's answer to the divine human rebellion, and he will renew all. All things in the world. And can I tell you what that would look like? What's it going to be like? Revelation 21, Then I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. The sea being a metaphor for the chaotic forces of evil. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among them, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. Listen, beloved, listen. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly, the unbelieving, and abominable, and murderers, and immoral persons, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. What a great opportunity we have to believe the gospel, to continue to persevere, in the midst of this thing called life that gets crazy and is dysfunctional and chaotic, the resurrection of Jesus Christ <clears throat> points to the ultimate restoration and renewal of all things. Do you believe? Do you believe? Let's pray together. And if you've never called upon the name of the Lord Jesus, I would urge you to do, do so now come from unbelief to belief. Do you want God to save you from your sin? Then pray that to him, if that's in your heart. Say, God, would you please save me from my sin? 
save me from myself. Have mercy on me. This message particularly is for the church, however. How has the Spirit of God used the preaching of His Word to speak to you, beloved? Would you take a few moments in confession and prayer? God has not let, God has not led us just to this area or to this point in our lives. He's going to lead us through this and that includes the pandemic. Call out to your God. He will lead us. He's going to feed us. He's going to provide for us. Call out to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Father God, thank you so much for your word. It brings such comfort and strength to us in our time of need. Thank you for the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. And I pray in his powerful, precious name, strengthen your bride. Strengthen your bride. Thank you for the hope that we have of paradise, the renewal of Eden on earth. Bring comfort to your people, I pray. Strengthen your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for listening.